Hello everyone, I am Siddharthan. The first module in our deep learning course is machine learning revision. And in the first video of this module, we have discussed about some of the basic concepts of machine learning. And this is the continuation of that video. So in this video, let's discuss about some advanced topics so that uh, for us it's easier to learn about deep learning. So let's get started. And these are the topics that we discussed in the first part of this machine learning revision. So first we have discussed what is the difference between AI, ML and deep learning. And then we have discussed about the different types of machine learning that included supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So the next topic was the types of supervised learning that constituted classification and regression. And the other one is the types of uh, unsupervised learning which includes clustering and association. We have also seen what is meant by this deep learning and what are all the different applications of deep learning. And the next topic was how a machine learning model works. So what is, you know, uh, the concept of how a machine learning model could learn from the data. Then we have understood what is meant by this model evaluation and what we exactly do there. And we have also discussed about overfitting and underfitting issues and how to solve them. And the last topic was on loss function. So these are the topics that we have covered. And if you haven't watched that particular video, I strongly suggest that please watch that video so that you can understand this video better. So the topics that we will be discussing today includes model parameters and hyperparameters. Okay. So we will try to understand what is the difference between these two types of parameters and what is meant by gradient descent. So these two are a very important concept in machine learning. So we will discuss about this. And then we will discuss some of the statistics uh, topics such as types of data. So what are all the different types of data that we have and what is meant by central tendencies. So we have certain measures called as central tendencies. So we will discuss about those topics and then we will discuss about correlation and causation. And the final thing that we will be discussing about is normal distribution and skewness. So these are all the topics that we will be discussing today. And as I've told you, these four, the last four are more on the statistics side. And once this part is completed, the next part of this machine learning revision will be on hands on topic. So we will try to understand like how we can solve a machine learning use case and what are all the different steps that has to be followed. So that will be in the covered in the next part of this machine learning revision. OK, so let's get started. And the first topic that we have is model parameters and hyperparameters. So it's important that we have to understand the difference between these two things. So as we know that the two types of parameters that we have for a machine learning model are model parameters and hyperparameters. So this is the definition for model parameters. These are the parameters of the model that can be determined by training with training data. These can be considered as internal parameters. So let's try to understand about this. So you can take any model, you can take any machine learning model. Each of this model has a parameter or you know a multiple parameters associated with them and our goal is to find the correct values or the right values for these parameters so that the model can make accurate prediction so examples of these parameters can be in the case of a linear regression model slope and intercept so we know that uh, the equation of a line is y is equal to mx plus c which is the same for a linear regression model so in this case uh, m and c which includes my slope and intercept will be my model parameters. So when our linear regression model tries to learn from the data, it will start with a random slope value and random intercept value. And our goal or the machine learning models goal is to find the you know proper value for this slope and intercept so that it can make accurate prediction as I told earlier. So you know this is what happens when we try to optimize this model parameters. And you know sometimes we call this uh, slope as weight w and intercept as bias b. Okay, so hence these two are example of model parameters. Similarly, all models as set of parameters associated with them. Okay, so this is the equation of a line or the equation of a linear regression model. So which is y is equal to w x plus b, where y is your uh, dependent variable and x is your independent variable. Uh, w is your weight. So we multiply this weight with our x and then we have this intercept value which is b or you know you can consider this as your bias value and the next thing that we have is hyperparameters so hyperparameters are the parameters whose values control the learning process these are adjustable parameters used to obtain an optimal model so we can also consider these parameters as external parameters now let's try to understand the significance of this hyperparameters so while discussing about model parameters i told you that uh, 
we start with a random weight value and bias value and we you know work our way through to reach this optimized parameter values or the best parameter values right and how this change is going to be is determined by this hyperparameters. So what this hyperparameter does is it kind of controls this learning process. So that's what I have mentioned here. So a few examples of these hyperparameters are learning rate and number of epochs. So let's say that we have this weight value and in each iteration. So we make this model to go through the data again, like which is basically the iteration and at each iteration we change the weight value so that it could, you know, the model could become better, right? So how much change this weight has to undergo is determined by this learning rate. Okay, so let's say the weight value is 5 and for the next iteration I want this weight value to be 7. So the change is 2. So that is this change value, this change magnitude is determined by this learning rate. And number of epochs is nothing but your uh, iteration count. Let's say that uh, in our logistic regression we can give this, uh, we have this parameter called as max iter. Which is basically the maximum number of iterations your model can have. Right, we can give this value as 100, so the default value is 100, so you can also give 1000 and all that thing, okay. So apart from these two things, there are also other parameters and also the hyperparameters changes for uh, different models. It's the same with the model parameters as, uh, as well. It's not like uh, all models are the same model parameters or the hyperparameters, okay. So that's one thing, but this is about it. So model parameters are those parameters which are uh, determined by the model itself by going through the data and this is very important. Whereas in the case of hyperparameters, we can give some values for this hyperparameters. It's not like the model finds this hyperparameter values, but we give this hyperparameter value such as learning rate, number of epochs and so on. Okay. So I hope you are clear with these two types of parameters. And with this understanding, let's move on to the next topic, which is gradient descent. So gradient descent is a very, very important concept in machine learning as well as uh, deep learning. So let's try to understand this in detail. So we know that this weight and biases are uh, model parameters. So weight decides how much influence the input will have on the output. So in the case of, uh, you know, linear regression, this is the equation, which is y is equal to wx plus b. And this is the equation. This is like uh, you can consider this as a multiple linear regression model where we have this multiple uh, features. So you have this y is equal to w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 plus b, which is basically in, in a three dimensional space. So in this case, w is nothing but it's a weight. And what it does is it kind of tells you how much important this x1 is. If you take w2, it tells you how much important x2 is and so on. So this is like the importance of weight or this weightage. And we also have this b, which is our bias value. So x is our feature, our input variable, and y is our target or output variable. You can also consider x as your independent variable and y as your dependent variable because y value depends on x value. And then we have our weight value w and bias value b. So bias is nothing but the offset value given to the model, which is nothing but your intercept in the case of a linear regression model. So uh, bias is used to shift the model in a particular direction. So this is the purpose of the bias and it is similar to a y-intercept as we discussed in the case of a linear regression model. So b is equal to y when all the feature values are zero. So, you know, I have, uh, you know, explained about this in detail when we have discussed about this gradient descent, uh, you know, in our machine learning course and also when we have discussed about this uh, linear regression intuition and so on. So if you want a detailed understanding, so please refer to those videos. And uh, I think as of now, it's clear. So we have weight and bias, which are, uh, which includes our uh, model parameters. And these two, these two are our um, hyperparameters, learning rate. And this learning rate is nothing but it is a tuning parameter in an optimization algorithm. So in this case, the optimization algorithm is nothing but your gradient descent. Okay. And it determines the step size at each iteration while moving toward a minimum of a loss function. Like you don't have to focus on this last part of the sentence, but just look at this step size. Step size is nothing but how much change you are going to give to your uh, parameter value or model parameter value at each iteration and number of epochs number of epochs is nothing but it represents the number of times the model iterates over the entire data set okay and then uh, the other thing so we have discussed about loss function the previous uh, video itself but i'll just explain this again so loss function uh, measures how far an estimated value is from its true value so we have estimated value is nothing but the value predicted by your model so predicted value and true value and this is helpful to determine which model performs better and which parameters are better but here we are focusing on which parameters are better basically so we use this loss function to understand 
for which model parameters our model is giving us uh, better results so that is the idea and we have the loss function value you know rather we have to call this as cost function so i have explained the difference between this loss function and cost function in the previous video also so when you find the difference between the estimated value and the true value for a single data point it's loss function when you take a summation it's called as a cost function but sometimes it's kind of used you know either way so loss is equal to 1 by n where n is the total number of data points and summation of y i minus y i cap whole square so this is example of mean squared loss so y i is nothing but your estimated value or predicted value so we call this as y i cap and y i is your true value so we find the difference between the true value and predicted value and we square that and when you know this, this is basically the error value and summation of all these data points so error value of all the data points and then we divide it by n okay so this will be your loss value so these three things are important to understand gradient descent the first is model parameter and then uh, hyper parameter and the final thing is loss function or cost function now let's try to understand what is the purpose of this gradient descent algorithm or you know the concept of gradient descent and how it helps us to build a better model okay so the purpose of this gradient descent as i have told you is model optimization which is nothing but to derive a more optimized model that could give you accurate results so optimization refers to determining best parameters for a model such that the loss function of the model decreases as a result of which the model can predict more accurately okay so basically optimization is all about finding the these best parameters for our model so we know that and this loss function of the model decreases so our main goal is to decrease this loss function because loss function is nothing but the distance between your true value and your predicted value if this loss function value is minimum or if this loss function value is small that means your true value is very close to your predicted value or like vice versa basically right so we always try to minimize this loss function value of our model so that our model has the highest accuracy so that's the idea and now let's try to understand this with an example so these are the data points that we have so we have like also let's say that these green, uh, blue color circles represents our data points and uh, we are trying to fit these data to a linear regression model which is nothing but a line and let's try different lines to see which line would be the most accurate line or the line that could pass through most of the data points first let's consider this line and let's say the equation of this line is y is equal to w1 x plus b1 this is similar to y is equal to mx plus b this w1 can be anything let's say this w1 is 3 and b is 5 so in that case your equation will be y is equal to 3x plus b so here we are considering this as w1 and b1 so w1 and b1 are the parameters of the line which is basically the parameters which are, which are you know your model parameters now let's consider a different line and let's say the equation of this line is y is equal to w2x plus b2 and finally we have a third line that is like this right and the equation for this line is y is equal to w3 x plus b3 right if you look at this three uh, lines we can say that i mean this line is closer to these four points and this line is closer to this top four points but this uh, third line is like closer to most of the points so we could say that this is the most optimized model or we can say that th this uh, you know model has the best parameters right but i can draw thousand lines in the space between them so we want to find these best parameters this best w3 value and b3 value and this is where we use our gradient descent so let's try to understand this gradient descent and uh, let's let's try to build this plot for weight value and your loss function value or you can consider your cost function value so when you plot this this is the curve that you get so you will get a u-shaped curve and now let's try to understand what this tells so let's say that we are considering a random weight value for our model and this is the random initial value let's say this this value can be anything let's say that this value is 2 and when my weight value is 2 my loss function value is this let's say the loss function value is 100 so that means you can see this point so this point is nothing but uh, the coordinate for this point is 2 comma 100 where 2 is your x coordinate value which is weight and 100 is your y coordinate value which is loss function so we can clearly say that for this particular weight value of 2 we are getting a higher loss function because this point is you know in the top of this y axis right so our goal is to reach a point so that 
the loss function value is minimum and in this curve we are getting this as the point for which you know the loss function value is minimum so if I consider this uh, let me just draw a line here at this point and we call this point as our global minimum so at this point my uh, loss function value is minimum right so we call this as our global minimum so global minimum is is basically at this point if you consider your weight value your your loss function value is minimum that means your model is like highly accurate so my goal is to start from this point change my weight value you know gradually so that the uh, you know we finally reach this global minimum so this is what happens in a gradient descent problem okay so we start with a random initial random initial weight value or a model parameter value and if the loss function value is you know higher at this point we gradually change this uh, parameter value such that it reaches this global minimum so if you consider this weight value you get a minimum loss function similarly let's say the random value that we consider uh, uh, you know is at this point maybe let's say the weight is like 20 so in this case we reduce the weight value so that we reach this global minimum so in the case of linear regression you have this one global minimum and uh, let's say we are, we are starting from this point and we are gradually increasing the weight value after this point if you increase your weight value anymore again your loss function value will increase so we, we won't do that so we will try to reach this point and stop here right so this is what happens in gradient descent and gradient descent kind of works basically using your uh, differential calculus okay so this is the idea of it so we start from a set of uh, parameter values random parameter values and we work our way through to reach this global minimum point so this is for uh, only one parameter which is our weight and if we want to draw this uh, with you know two parameters in three dimension this is what it would like so we have j of w comma b which is your cost function and we have this uh, you know weight in one dimension and bias value in other dimension and this is our global minimum right so this is how the you know it would look in a three dimensional plane so what happens here is we start from any point in this like in this picture so we start there and we try to gradually change our weight value and bias value until we reach this global minimum so at this point we are having a minimum cost function value so that our model is predicting accurately so this is the idea of uh, gradient descent and this is how you know the mathematical aspects of gradient descent looks like so this is the definition of gradient descent which is gradient descent is an optimization algorithm used for minimizing the loss function in various machine learning algorithms so we use this gradient descent in linear regression logistic regression and, and you know different kind of models that we have in machine learning and it is used for updating the parameters of the learning model so we have seen right we continuously change our parameter values until we reach this global minimum so that's what uh, is uh, meant by this updating the parameters and this is the formula so w2 is equal to w1 minus l into dw okay and uh, this w2 is your updated weight and w1 is your previous weight right like if we consider this case this is your w1 and then we change this weight value right so this is your w2 and in the next step this will be your w1 and this will be your w2 so that's what mentioned here and uh, you can see the other terms so we have a w as our weight and this is for weight and this is for bias so w is for weight b is for bias and this l is nothing but your learning rate and this is very very important so this learning rate which we have seen that it is a hyper parameter right so in this case we are starting from a weight value and we are changing our weight value to this weight value and how much change that we are imparting to this weight is dictated by your learning rate okay so i'll explain this again so you have us we are gradually changing this weight value and from this second weight value I'm, I'm changing to this third weight value so how much change i'm giving here is determined by the learning rate that i give for my model right so it's w to updated weight is equal to previous weight minus learning rate into dw now we have to understand what is meant by this dw dw is nothing but partial derivative of loss function with respect to w what this means is uh, this is basically like d loss or you can say that we are differentiating loss function with respect to weight or in other words we could say that for a change in weight value we are finding how much the loss function changes right in the case of this db so for a change in uh, you know 
bias value how much your loss function value changes so which is basically differential calculus so we do this continuously so that we reach our global minimum so the main idea here is to reach that global minimum so that you are minimizing your loss function and you are increasing the accuracy of your model so i hope that you are clear with this gradient descent and uh, we will move on to the next topic which is types of data see what are the different types of data we have in statistics and machine learning so the broad classification of the data which we have is categorical data and numerical data so what is meant by this categorical data so categorical data is nothing but they are represented in categories or classes so let's say that there is a data regarding the gender of a person in that case it tells the categories right whether the person is male or not so let's consider another example so we are considering the color of a ball so uh, the color can be red it can be blue or it can be green so these are nothing but categories or classes so this kind of uh, data is called as categorical data and there is another type of data called as numerical data so numerical data are nothing but numbers so let's say that uh, you know we have discussed about this weather, weather forecasting uh, application right so in weather forecasting we uh, measure the what is the temperature in that particular day or what is the rainfall uh, or what is the humidity so these are all numerical data right so these are the two broad classification of the data which are categorical data or numerical data and this categorical data can be classified into nominal data and ordinal data and numerical data can be classified into discrete data and continuous data so these are uh, the classifications of data now let's try to understand about these uh, four uh, classifications what is nominal data so a nominal data is a classification of categorical variables that do not provide any quantitative value okay so let's try to understand this so i have already explained to you this example right so if we consider the gender of a person it is example of a categorical data and we have male and female so there is not any particular significance in this data so we cannot tell that one gender is you know more significant than the other right so it is just you know some data and there is not much significance in both of this data so this kind of data is called as nominal data and you can also consider this uh, color example color of a ball so a ball can be red in color or it can be green in color or it can be yellow in color right so there is not that much significance that goes into these categories and there is uh, this data called as ordinal data and ordinal data are the type of data in which the values follow a natural order so this is also a categorical data but the classes have significance to them let's say that we are conducting a review for a smartphone and the reviews are uh, whether the phone is good or it is uh, very good or it is very bad okay so you know if bad represents that phone is not at all good right so it it has some negative value to it if we say that the phone is smartphone is good that means it is you know it, it's in the average range it is okay and if we say that the phone is very good that means it is very easy to use and it is you know very uh, you know uh, good to use and such kind of things right so here this is also categorical data where we have three categories whether the phone is bad or good or it is very good so this is also categories but there are significance to it where uh, the whether the phone is good or uh, bad or it is very good but when you consider nominal data there is not any significance in the categories uh, which we have so as i have explained to you when we take a uh, male or female we cannot you know uh, order it right but in the case of ordinal data we can order it so bad good and very good so there is some natural order to it and there is some significance to different classes we have so this is about nominal data and ordinal data and then we have discrete data and continuous data in the case of numerical data types so discrete data are the type of data that can only take certain values so certain value in the sense they cannot take some uh, you know mid values mid values in the sense decimal values so if we uh, consider the number of students in a class we can say that there are about 50 students in a class right but we cannot say that there are 50.5 students in a class you cannot say that uh, there are uh, 60.3 students in a class so we can just give our number uh, you know an integer type of values and not a decimal type of values and this kind of numerical data is called as discrete data and then we have this continuous data so continuous data can have almost any numerical value unlike discrete data they can have decimal values so you can consider the weight of an object so you can say that the weight of this particular object is 30.5 kilograms so here you can take decimal values so this is the difference between discrete data and continuous data so these are the main four classifications of the type of data which we deal with so the first type is nominal data where you know there are just categories and there are no order to this categories there is no significance to any categories and we treat all the categories as similar 
and then we have this ordinal data where there is some natural order to this data and there is some significance to each of these classes so these two comes under categorical data and then we have numerical data where in discrete data it cannot take any decimal values but it can take only discrete values uh, as uh, the example given in the number of students in a classroom where we can have only 50 students or 60 students not 50.5 or 16.5 students and then we have this continuous data where it can take decimal values like the weight of an object so these are the different types of data we can have in statistics and also in machine learning the next topic that we can discuss is measure of central tendencies so this central tendencies includes three measures which are mean median and mode tendency central tendency is a measure it is a value that represents the center point or typical value of a data set okay it is a value that summarizes the data okay so don't take the literal meaning of central value so think about like this so it is one value that represents your data okay so consider that you have a data set with 20 values and uh, let's say that you want to represent these 20 values with the help of only one value how this is possible so in that case you can use the measures of central tendency okay so the one interesting example which we all can relate is the gpa so in colleges we would have you know secured uh, some amount of gpa right so what is meant by this gpa so during our uh, academics in college we used to write a lot of exams and there will be a lot of subjects and we will get a grade for each of the subjects right and uh, gpa is a one value that summarizes the entire academic performance of a student right so it is a measure of central tendency so you know to be more precise it is a different form of a mean value okay so it is one value that represents the entire data so here the data we have here is the academic performance of a student okay so that is what is meant by a central tendency which is it, it is a summarizing value of the entire data or it is the central value of the data okay so there are three main types of central tendencies they are mean median and mode so these three values represents the measure of central tendency now let's try to understand each of these values with examples okay first of all let's try to understand mean so this is the definition of mean mean or arithmetic mean is the sum of values divided by the number of values so mean we can also call this as an average so we all are familiar with mean right so it is nothing but the average value so what we try, what we do to find the average value or mean value is that we take all the data and we add all these data and divide it by the number of data we have okay so let's try to understand this with uh, an example and also let's try to understand the formula for mean so let's say that m is the mean value of a data and sigma represents summation so summation of x so x is the data points that we have data points in the sense if you have a you know a data set and there are 10 values in the data set so each value is called as a data point the individual data is called as a data point okay so x represents each of those values so summation of x means we uh, we need to uh, add all those values and the n represents the number of values okay so if you have a data set with 10 values so in that case n will be 10 so you will add all those values and divide it by uh, yeah, so this is called as the arithmetic mean or you know or simply mean or it can also be called as the average value okay so <clears throat> let's consider this example these are the heights of five people so we have the heights in centimeter as uh, 160 centimeter 172 165 168 174 so a group of five people and let's say that we want one value that represents the height of these five people so a mean value or a central value so we can find this central value by using mean method so in this case we will uh, sum all the values or we will add all the values so so from 160 to 174 so we have five values and we add all the values and we divide it by uh, divide it by five because we totally have five values right so that's the reason so in this case n is equal to five and the result which you get is 167.8 in this case so this is the mean value in this case so you just need to add all those values and divide it by the number of observation or number of data we have so this is all about mean value and then we have median value so the median is the middle value in the list of numbers to find the median the numbers have to be listed in numerical order from smallest to largest okay so this is about median so let's say that we have a data set and there are about nine values in the data set 
okay so in this case what we will do is to find the median we will try to arrange these nine values in order so what is the central value so the central value or middle value is nothing but the fifth value right so once you arrange so this is very important so you cannot take the data set as such you need to uh, arrange the data set in order from in an ascending order so when you arrange it uh, the fifth value become the middle value or the central value and that will be your median okay so let's try to understand this with a similar example so we have the you know same heights here which we have uh, which we add here but in a different order so in this case this is not in an ascending order right from smallest to largest whereas we have arranged this particular data heights of people in centimeter in an ascending order so 160 165 168 172 and 174 so we have arranged this in ascending order so try to find which is the middle value here so this totally contains five value and the middle value is the third value right so i have circled this in red circle so you can see here so this is the median value because it is the middle value in our small data set okay so there may be cases when we have even number of values so in this case we have uh, you know odd number of values so we have chosen this as a middle value but what you can do when you have even number of values so in this case we totally have uh, six values right so how you can find the median value so in this case what you have to do here is we choose the two central values so in this case the two central values are the third value and the fourth value now we need to find the average of these two values or the mean of these two values so we need to add 168 and 172 and divide it by 2 so the answer which you get here is 117 and this will be our median so the median of this six data points so this is how you will find a median so the first thing which you need to note here is we need to arrange the data in ascending order here you can see that the data is in ascending order so without arranging the order or, you know without arranging the data we cannot find the median so it would be a you know a wrong approach so we arrange the data in ascending order and we find what is the middle value and uh, in the case of odd number of values so it is easy to find the middle value because we have only one value but when there are even number of data points we take uh, the two middle values and divide it by two and we will get the median <laughs> and this may arise a question in your mind we already have a central value called as mean and why we need median so this will be a question right so the importance of median is mean cannot be a good measure in or in all cases so mean is a very good measure but it cannot be considered as the best measure in all the cases so just consider this example so here we have the values as 160 172 165 168 and 174 right let's say that we have another value as 190 centimeter let's say that there is another person who is very tall and uh, that will be our sixth data point or sixth observation so in that case if you find the mean your mean value will be very huge and uh, when you compare all the data points all the individual data points with the mean value there will be a very huge variation among them so in the case of outliers so this is an outlier right so all these values are almost in a similar kind of range so it is in 160 and 160s and uh, very few values are 172 if you have a value around 190 then uh, that is called as an outlier because other values are in a you know almost in a similar range but uh, the uh, one single value is in a more higher range in that cases when you have some outliers in your data your mean value will be affected drastically because of that outlier so whenever you have the outlier it is uh, best to arrange the data in order and find the median value so in that cases a median will be a good measure as the central value to represent your data so the main thing to note here is if there is a uniform distribution of data so there is not much you know difference in the range of the values you have in that case we you know try to find the mean and if you have outliers or if uh, one or two or very few values are uh, high or if the few values are very low in that case we try to find the median and median will be a best measure so this is the use of mean and median and the difference between them and finally we have this mode value right and the mode is the value that occurs most often if no number is no number in the list is repeated then there is no mode for the list so mode is a value that that has repeated so many times in a list so let's consider this so we have heights of uh, five people and this you, and in this you can see which value has repeated many times so we have 160 and 160 has appeared two times in this particular data set or particular list 
and we have only one 172, one 168 and only one 174. The value that is repeated most is 160 and in this case the mode will be 160. So this is meant by mode and mode also has uh, you know very good importance when we are considering central tendencies. So that will be explained in the next slide so please wait and uh, now I hope you are clear and aware of what is meant by mean, median and mode. So mean is the normal average value that we get by adding all the data points and dividing it by the total number of data points we have. And median is nothing but arranging the data points in order and finding which is the middle value. And mode, mode is nothing but the most number of repeated values. And if there are no repeated values, then we don't have mode. So there may be cases when the mean, median and mode can be similar. Okay, so it is not that always uh, mean, median and mode should be different. So that is not always the case. So there will be cases when all these th all these uh, three values will be similar will be equal okay so that is you know actually very common so to have mean median and mode value to be similar so and this happens mostly in the normal distribution or uniform distribution okay so to this understanding now let's try to uh, you know uh, understand where we where we will use these uh, central tendency values when it comes to machine learning okay so the main application of these central tendencies in machine learning is in data pre processing so we know that data pre-processing that we do in several machine learning projects and in uh, data science projects and data pre-processing is all about processing our data before feeding it to our uh, machine learning model. So we cannot feed the raw data to our machine learning model. So we need to do some processing and this step is called as data pre-processing. And one main important step in data pre-processing is handling the missing values. So the data set contains missing values. A lot of the data set contains missing values and we cannot feed the data set which, which uh, misses some value to our machine learning model. So we need to handle this missing values. So we need to you know do some uh, operations on those missing values and replace them with suitable values before feeding it to a machine learning model. And this is where central tendencies are very helpful for us. So central tendencies are very useful in and handling the missing values in a data set. So this is the uh, main application of central tendencies when it comes to machine learning. So now let's try to understand where we can use or where we can replace the missing values with mean and where we can replace the values with median and where to replace the values with mode. So we have these three values, right? And there are specific cases where we need to choose each of these values, okay? First of all, let's try to understand where we can use mean value. So missing values in a data set can be replaced with mean value if the data is uniformly distributed. So if you have a normal distribution and it, uniform distribution means, uh, you know, almost all the data points are in a similar range. So there is not much, uh, you know, changes in the data. So they are almost in the same range as we have seen in the eight example. So in that cases, uh, let's say that we have uh, a data set containing 500 data points and uh, it contains eight of 500 different peoples and uh, let's say that about uh, 10 values or 20 values are missing from this particular data set. So in that case, what we will do is, so it is, uh, you know, you can consider it as a uniformly distributed value. So in most of the cases, the it will be almost similar for uh, different people, right? So there won't be a very huge change uh, between them. So the it can, the it value can range from 160 to, you know, maybe 190 or something like that, 180 maybe. So there is a particular range in which height of the people are generally, right? So in that cases, we have almost a uniform distribution or a symmetric distribution. In that case, we can replace those 20 missing values in the data set with mean value, okay? Now let's try to understand when we can replace the missing values with median value. So missing values in a data set can be replaced with median value if the data is skewed. So skewed in the sense, uh, you know, this is an example of a right skewed distribution where there is more number of data in one side okay so this is not a normal distribution so the data will be in one side and uh, uh, let's say that there is uh, uh, let's consider this we are taking a data set with salaries of different people let's say that a person is making uh, 5 lakhs per annum okay and there are people who are making a uh, 5 lakhs 6 lakhs 7 lakhs etc and there are very few people uh, who are making money of about uh, 20 lakhs per annum or 25 lakhs per annum. So those people with uh, 20 lakhs per annum and uh, 25 lakhs per annum will be in this particular, uh, you know, spot and the number of people earning that much will be slightly uh, less and the number of people earning in the range of 3 lakh, 4 lakh and 5 lakh will be more and uh, this is the curve which you will get 
if you plot such kind of data so if you check the distribution of such kind of data so it will be a skewed distribution and if your data is a skewed distribution it won't be a proper way to use mean value so in that case we will be replacing the missing values with median value and then we have mode so mode also in missing values can be replaced with mode if the data is skewed if the data is skewed we can also use for mode values as well and the another main application of mode value is that if there are some missing values in the categorical column so categorical column in the sense they contains categories or classes so you can think about it like uh, the gender of a person or color of a ball and something like that so they are just categories and not numerical values whereas we have discussed the numerical values in the case of mean and median and we cannot find a uh, mean and median for categorical values we can find only the mode so mode is nothing but the most number of repeated values right so when categorical values are missing in a data set in most cases we use mode so these are the three uh, cases where we will use these central tendencies the next important topic that we are going to discuss is correlation and causation correlation so what is meant by the word correlation so correlated means something is related right so two things are related to each other so that's when we say that the two things are correlated to each other right so where, where where we can use this correlation in machine learning or data analysis let's try to understand this with an example let's say that we have a data set which contains prices of houses in a city okay and we want to do some data analysis on this particular data set so what is the analysis that we can do with this particular data set one thing which we can do is find which factors affect the price of the house so we can try to find which factors increase the price of a particular house and which factors reduce the price of a house so what we are basically trying to do is find the relationship between the features in a data set okay so i'll give you an example let's say that uh, let's try to understand which factors would affect the house price so one factor is the location where the house is situated let's say that uh, the house is situated in a more populated and more active part of the city then the price is obviously going to be more right in case if the house is situated in a, in more outskirts of the city then the price is not going to be that much the price will be lower so this is one factor that affects the house price and we can think about other uh, factors as well so if you think about the size of the house or the number of rooms in a house if there are more number of rooms or if the size of the house is more then the price is obviously going to be more right so these features or these parameters such as number of rooms and the location where the house is situated so these are called as features that are present in this particular house price data set and correlation will help us to find the relationship between the features in a data set okay so this is where we are going to use these concepts now let's try to understand about correlation and causation in a more detailed way with suitable examples so first let's try to understand about correlation so correlation is a measure that determines the extent to which two variables are related to each other in a data set so don't look at this second statement just uh, you know try to understand the first statement let's come to this uh, later so correlation is a measure so it is a numerical measure and what is this numerical measure is it will tell us the extent to which two variables are related to each other so two variables in the sense in the house examples that we have seen the price of the house is one variable and uh, the location where it is situated is another variable so correlation will tell us how you know up to what extent two variables are related to each other and there is another important thing which we need to you know take note of but it doesn't mean that one event is the cause of the other event so what we are trying to say here is two variables can be correlated to each other like for example one variable increases if the other variable increases or one variable may decrease if the other variable increase so these two variables are correlated but this doesn't mean one variable is the cause and the other variable is the effect so we cannot say that so one event does not cause the other event so they are just related to each other but one is not the cause for the other so this is what we need to be more aware of so there are two types of correlation one is positive correlation and the second one is negative correlation so what is meant by a positive correlation let's take two variables if two variables have a direct proportionality between them direct proportionality means if one value increases the other value also increases or if one value decreases the other value also decreases in that case the two values or the two variables are directly proportional to each other right 
so this kind of relationship or this kind of correlation is positive correlation where the two variables move in the same direction either they both increase or they both decrease okay so negative correlation is one in which if one value increases the other value will decrease or if one value decrease the other value increases so their movement is in opposite direction okay so this is the difference between positive correlation or negative correlation so you can say that positively correlated variables are directly proportional and negatively correlated variables are inversely proportional to each other okay so let's try to uh, understand this with our house example so we have two axes here and we are going to take two parameters one is the number of rooms so we are taking the number of rooms in the x-axis and we are taking the house price in the y-axis and we are going to plot the number of uh, rooms and house price and see what is the graph we are getting let's say that we have about 10 data points and each data points represents the number of rooms and house price okay so let's say that we get these 10 data points plotted in this graphs so the y-axis represent the house price so here we can see a, a trend here that if the number of rooms increases the house price also increase right so you can fit this uh, data points in a straight line okay so now you can say that these two variables number of rooms is one variable and house price is another variable these two variables are positively correlated because as the number of rooms increases the house price also increases now let's try to understand negative correlation so again we have two axes and we are going to take two other variables one is crime rate and house price let's try to you know plot the crime rate that is happening in a city and what is the price of uh, the houses in that particular city and this is the plot which we get if we try to find the data you know if we try to plot the data points and now you can also see a trend here if the crime rate in a city increases the house price also you know decreases so if this crime rate increases house price decreases so this is the trend that we are getting for this imaginary problem okay so this is the difference between positive correlation and negative correlation where if one variable increases the other value or other variable increases in positive correlation and if one variable increases the other variable decreases as in negative correlation so now let's try to understand the second statement with these examples so what i have mentioned here is it does not mean that one event is the cause of the other event so what we are trying to do is or what we are trying to understand here is we cannot say that this number of rooms alone is the main reason why the house price is increasing so there may be another uh, you know hidden variables also so you can also think about uh, the uh, location where it is situated so we have already already discussed about it so if the price is situated or oh, sorry if the house is situated in in an outskirt of the city and even though it may contain many number of rooms the house price may not be more because it is not an active area right so there are maybe other variables that would affect the house price so we cannot say that this is the cause of this particular event here uh, one event or one variable is number of rooms and we cannot say that this is the cause for increase in house price so what we can say here is these two variables are correlated but we cannot say that one is the cause and the other is the effect okay so that's what we need to understand here in correlation we just try to find the relationship and we cannot say that these two are cause and effect pair okay so this takes us to the next concept which is causation so what is meant by this causation in statistics causation means that one event causes another event to occur thus there is a cause and effect relationship between the two variables in a data set so Contrary to the correlation, in causation, we try to prove that two variables or two events are cause and effect pair. If one event occurs, the other event will occur. Okay. If one event does not occur, the other event won't occur. So that is meant by causation. So there is a causal relationship between the two variables. So let's try to understand this with another example. So let's compare the number of ice cream sales and, uh, you know, temperature of a particular day so we take the data points for several days and let's try to compare the ice cream sales and the average temperature of a particular day let's say that we are uh, taking two axes so one axis contains the average temperature in you know several days and the in y axis we have number of ice cream sales so let's try to plot the data points and let's say that we have 10 data points and this is how we get the plot so here you can see a direct proportionality between the two variables so what this means is if the average temperature increases people tend to buy more ice creams so let's say that we have uh, the data points for 10 different days and what is the inference that we are getting is if the temperature is more the ice cream sales is more so this is obvious that increase in temperature you know causing people 
to buy more ice creams so there is a cause and effect pair here so summer season causes more ice cream sales so this is the inference we are getting and since th there is a clear cause and effect relationship or cause and effect pair we can say that there is a causal relationship between them. So this is the difference between correlation and causation where in correlation we say that two variables are related to each other, two variables are correlated to each other whereas in causation we say that one event causes the other event to occur. If there is not, uh, if that event is not occurring, the other event is not going to occur as well. So this is the difference between correlation and causation. So now I'll explain you or I'll show you where we have used this correlation in our machine learning project. So we have dealt with several regression machine learning projects in our YouTube channel and uh, one such example is this house price prediction. So in this project we try to uh, use machine learning algorithm to find the house prices based on several parameters. So these are the parameters that we add for our uh, prediction. So the time rate, what is the zone it is in and other parameters. So you can see this NOx here. So it is the you know pollution. Uh, measure so it is the nitrogen oxide measure and we have rm so this rm column represents the number of room and what is the average uh, age of the people who is uh, in that particular house and other parameters are there and finally we have this l stat so l stat represents the median house price value so this is our target variable our house price okay so here we try to find the correlation uh eat map here so here i have used this corr function so this function is present in the pandas library and you can watch my house price prediction uh, video if you want to get more information on this. So this CORR function will try to find the correlation between all the features in the data set. And then we will try to plot this correlation in a heat map. So I, I have already explained to you that correlation is a numerical value, right? So it is a measure. So it is a value. And we try to put this value in a heat map. So what does this heat map, uh, you know, tells us? So in this horizontal axis, it contains all the parameters and the vertical axis also contains the contains various parameters that we have. Okay. And this uh, bar represents the value of correlation. So plus one means there is a dark color and this means that two variables are highly positively correlated. That if one variable increases, the other variable also increase. And if the value is negative, so here we have minus 0 0.6 and the color is light, right? So this means that two values are negatively correlated. Okay, so now you can look at this heat map. So I'll show this example. So this is RM. So RM represents the number of rooms in a particular house and this price. So there is this price column. Sorry, I told that LSTAT is the price. So it is not the price. So we have a other column called as price. So this represents in thousand dollars. So 24 means 24,000 uh, US dollars. Okay, so LSTAT is not the price. Now let's compare the number of rooms present in a house and the price of the house so if you just look at this value you will see that there is a 0 0.7 value so that means the two values are positively correlated that is they are highly positively correlated that means if the number of rooms increases in house the price of the house is also going to increase okay and let's try to look at this tax if the tax is more in that particular uh, for that particular house the price is negatively correlated so there is a negative correlation between tax and price whereas there is a positive correlation between number of rooms and price so what is the importance of finding this correlation so this will help us to select important features so not all the features in our data set are important so you can see here we have various features and finding this correlation will help us to find which uh, you know features are uh, related to the price and which features we can select for our prediction so then we can choose appropriate models for the prediction so this is the you know importance of finding this correlation uh, in a particular data set the next topic that we are going to discuss is normal distribution and skewness. So the understanding of distribution gives us a overall picture of how our data is distributed. So let's get started. So a normal distribution is an arrangement of a data set in which most of the data points lie in the middle of the range and the rest taper off symmetrically towards either extreme. Okay. So this is the formal definition of normal distribution. So you can pause the video and you can go through this definition again. So let's try to understand what uh, what is conveyed by this definition. So we have a data set and uh, I would like to give you the difference between what is meant by a data set and what is meant by a data point. Let's say that there are 100 students in a class and we are measuring the height of all the 100 students in that particular class. So height of all the 100 students is called as a data set and height of each individual student is called as a data point. So data set represents the entire data 
and data point represents the individual data okay so that is the difference between them so a data set in this case contains 100 data points right okay so this is the difference between them now let's try to understand about this normal distribution so in this particular data set what happens is majority of the data points so most of the data points lie in the middle range so let's say that the height of the students so uh, sorry the height uh, ranges from 120 centimeter to 210 centimeter okay so most of the students tend to be in the middle range so let's say that the middle range of uh, student height is 160 centimeter to 170 centimeter and most of the students will tend to be in this average height and there will be less number of students who fall in this 120 uh, centimeter and there will be also less number of students who are in the range of uh, 200 centimeter okay so this kind of uh, distribution is called as a normal distribution so if i explain you this with this curve you it will make more sense okay so you can understand this better so we have height in the x-axis and probability in the y-axis now as i have uh, told you in the height example so let's say that this uh, particular point represents uh, height of maybe 120 centimeter and this particular end represents height of 210 centimeter okay so this curve represents the number of people we have okay so the number of people in that particular height range so y-axis represents that in this case you can see here the curve is uh, curve as a bump here so this means most number of people are in this particular height so in this height there are more number of people whereas in this two height ranges so in this left extreme and right extreme there are very less number of students with that particular height okay so this is an example of a normally distributed curve and uh, the y-axis represents probability the probability of finding a student in that particular height okay so we know that the probability value ranges from 0 and 1 so 0 is the minimum value that you can have for a probability and what represents the maximum value you can have for a probability okay and let's say that uh, this particular uh, point represents a probability of 0.8 let's say that the height in this case is 160 centimeter or uh, 165 centimeter okay so this point represents a height of 160 centimeter now uh, a probability of 0.8 represents we have a 80 percentage chance that we will find a student with height of 165 centimeter so this is what is represented by this probability so we have the value in the x-axis and we have the probability of finding that value in the y-axis. So this is how a normally distributed curve looks like. Okay. So a normally distributed curve or the normal distribution can also be called as a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So the other name for normal distribution is Gaussian distribution. And we may also call this uh, normal distribution as a bell shaped curve. As you can see here, this is in the shape of a bell, right? So this is an example of a uh, bell shaped curve. And the other thing which you need to note here is this curve is symmetrical about its central axis. So you can consider the central vertical axis and this curve is symmetrical about the uh, two other sides to the left side and the right side. So this is all about normal distribution. So the main thing which you need to note here is most of the data will be uh, situated in this middle range and uh, in the either of the two extremes left extreme and right extremes there will be less number of data points okay so that is what is represented by this uh, particular line so the rest taper off symmetrically towards either extreme so there is a taper in this curve right so there is a slant in either side where we have less number of values in either extremes and more number of values in the central region okay so that is all about normal distribution now let's try to understand what is meant by this skewness so a skewed data is completely different from a normally distributed data so we understood that what is meant by a normally distributed data now let's discuss about skewness so a data is considered skewed when the distribution curve appears distorted or skewed either to the left or to the right in a standard distribute in a statistical distribution okay so this is the definition of skewness we know that a normal distribution is symmetrical right a normal distribution curve is symmetrical whereas a skewed distribution curve uh, won't be symmetrical okay so there are two kinds of skewness one is negative skewness and uh, positive skewness so we can call this as negatively skewed and positively skewed okay so in this case you can see here in the case of negatively skewed uh, curve there will be a taper or a slant in the left side okay in the negative region so we know that in number system we take negative values in the left side and positive values in the right side here skew represents so the word skew represents the slant so here the slant is in the left side so hence it is called as a negatively skewed and in the case of a negatively skewed data we have more number of data in the right extreme in the positive region okay so in the case of positively skewed data 
the tapper or the slant is in the right side and we have more number of data in the left side okay so in the case of negatively skewed we have more number of data in the right side whereas in the case of positively skewed we have more number of data in the left side so that is the difference between these two okay and the central one is the normal normally distributed data okay so which is symmetrical about the two axes so the other thing which we are going to discuss is mean median and mode so these are the three main important parameters right so this is called as central tendencies mean median mode so these values are called as central tendencies and we have discussed about what is meant by a mean median and mode in our uh, statistics video so i'll give the link for that video in the description of this video as well okay so you can check that out as well so mean represents the average value if there are 100 students in a class and we are measuring the height we sum up all the heights and divide it by 100 so it is nothing but the sum of all the values divided by total number of values and this value represents mean and median is nothing but the central value the middle value so in this case we try to order uh, you know we try to ascending order so we try to arrange the values in the ascending order and we try to find which is the middle value and that middle value is called as the median and mode is nothing but the most number of repeated values okay so that is the difference between mean median and mode so when it comes to a normal distribution so the mean median mode will be in the central region okay whereas when it comes to a negatively skewed uh, data the mode will be in the right side because we know that this is where uh, most number of data points are uh, situated right so the mode will be in the right hand side and median will be in the middle portion of the data the entire data and mean will be in the left side when it comes to a negatively skewed data and this will be completely opposite when it comes to a positively skewed data so the most number of data are present in the uh, left side so the mode will most probably in this particular region and we have median in this particular region so medium is nothing but the middle value and we have mean in this particular region so this is how the parameter looks for uh, these three kinds of distribution okay so you can think about the examples of uh, the skewed data as well so you can consider this example average income of people in different cities okay so let's say that uh, there is a city where more number of people tend to make more income okay so let's take income in the x-axis so uh, left side represents people with lower income and right side represents people with higher income so let's say that a there is a city in which people tend to make more income so it will be an example of a negatively skewed data because we have more number of data in this particular region so let's say that there is a city which is comparatively poorer and more number of people in that particular city makes very less income so in this case we have more number of data in this left side region so hence this is a positively skewed data so this is an example of a positive uh, skew and a negative skew okay so that is all about normal distribution and skewness and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video and i'll see you in the next upload thanks for watching